How does one man become the richest international drug lord, a feared politician, and walk out of jail with 600 gunmen surrounding the building? The story of Pablo Escobar is so wild, you won't believe your ears. There's bombs, presidents, and even hippos. We're talking about a guy who single-handedly changed the drug game forever. Not just with his business practices, but with his public flauntings, showmanship, and body count. He makes Al Capone and Scarface look like Pee Wee Herman and Alfonso from The Little Rascals. His meteoric rise into becoming one of the most feared gangsters of all is as wild as how he spent his money. Truly, he was the Willy Wonka of crime. Like other crime lords, Pablo Escobar cut his teeth with petty street frauds and thefts before forming his own gang. Records of his early years are hard to find, but word on the street is he used to steal gravestones to repurpose them for other customers. At least he was into recycling. After that, he became the go-to car thief because he could dismantle a vehicle and sell off the parts in record time. He even had enough bank to persuade cops to look the other way. By the time he was 20 years old, he had already served prison time, paid off officials, and gotten into the habit of holding people for ransom if they owed him money. If people owed him money, he'd kidnap them and hold them for ransom. Sometimes he'd tear up the money that was delivered to him just to prove a point. One hostage was Diego Echaviara Misam, a Colombian philanthropist whose family handed over $50,000 in exchange for his life. Instead of releasing him, Escobar and his men killed him and kept the money. But his big break was in the 1970s. Colombia's biggest exports was cocaine. He wasn't the first man to smuggle white powder internationally, but Escobar's interest in its profitability motivated him to take out the man who was the first to smuggle it. His thirst power made him ruthless. Quote, silver or lead became the catchphrase when offering bribes to officials. And with a deal like that on the table, which law enforcement agency wouldn't take his money? In fact, in 1975, he was caught coming over the border early in his cocaine enterprise, but the arresting officer that led to his infamous mugshot would later find himself six feet under. To say Pablo held grudges would be an understatement. This reputation for cutthroat business practices meant Pablo multiplied his smuggling routes within years. In a short amount of time, he'd gone from petty drug dealer to virtually monopolizing Colombia's cocaine market. He was making so much money that he would need to spend $2,500 a month on plastic bands just to keep his wads of cash organized. And you thought you had money problems. At its height, Escobar's cartel, the Medellin cartel, was raking in $20 billion a year. And that's not including inflation since the 1970s. Pablo's personal wealth reached as high as $30 billion, which was more than enough to create his own personal palace, complete with a personal zoo filled with exotic animals. His imported hippos have since escaped and have begun breeding in the wild. Not your average pest problem. Pablo became so wealthy that he discounted 10% of everything he made, knowing that the cash he was storing would get lost, become rotten, or get eaten by rats. Again, you thought you had money problems? Yet he had a public image of a loving and caring man, thanks to his mistress, Virginia Vallejo, a successful television journalist. Their romance started when the besotted drug lord caught her fronting advertisements for pantyhose. This endorsement was a move to cash in on her television success. So it was the next logical step that she brings him on her show. She was the first one to get him in front of a camera and painted him as, quote, a man of the people. She became one of his go-to confidants during their whirlwind romance, and he spoiled her with all the luxuries and experiences that blood money can buy. Of course, she says she was charmed by his affability and sense of humor, but it's interesting how attractive a man becomes when he's a billionaire. To give the devil his due, Escobar was charitable, he grew up in the slums, 
so paid it back to those left behind. He'd spent millions creating soccer fields and housing complexes for the homeless, as well as roads and power lines for the poorest neighborhoods. But all good things come to an end. Pablo broke up with her when he learned that she had other boyfriends. Frankly, she was lucky that being dumped by Escobar didn't mean being dumped in a shallow grave. In the end, she escaped to the U.S. to testify in drug cases against those she had befriended. Talk about a backstabbing ex. Crazier than his love affair with a television journalist was his love affair with politics. Fairly early in his cocaine career, Escobar wanted to become a politician, not just to further inoculate his empire from scrutiny, but also to continue his community projects. Needless to say, politicians didn't take kindly to a bribing, corrupt criminal joining the ranks. It takes one to know one. To be fair, parliamentary immunity and a diplomatic passport is not the best thing to give an international drug smuggler. So when Escobar gained a seat through being an alternate, admittedly, they squeezed him out of the inner corridors of power. His mugshot arrest was used to expel him, but Pablo struck back three months later with assassinations. From here, Escobar's short-lived political career became even bloodier. On the 6th of December, 1989, the Medellin cartel parked a truck filled with 500 kilograms of dynamite outside the building for the administrative apartment of security. Their target was Miguel Alfredo Maza Marquez. He escaped unharmed, but 57 people died instantly in the blast that decimated 14 city blocks. Make no mistake, Escobar will remove anyone who stands in his way, even innocent people. Just a month earlier, on 27th of November, the cartel had tried to take out a presidential candidate by planting a bomb on a domestic passenger jet. The target, Cesar Gaviria Trujillo, survived because he missed the flight and went on to become president. But in an added sick twist, the triggerman had been duped into carrying the bomb. Alberto Prieto was the poor sap, tricked into thinking the suitcase carrying explosives was actually a tape recorder that he would need to turn on to capture the conversation between two people. These acts were a logical progression from what had happened a few years earlier at the Palace of Justice. In 1985, the Supreme Justices were re-examining their extradition policy with the U.S. To Pablo, an American prison was worse than a Colombian grave, so he funded a siege by the far-left terrorist group M-19. For them, the execution of half of the magistrates was an act of social justice. For Pablo, his hoodwinking of violent radicals was just another way to buy him more time. But he wouldn't escape the law forever. In a deal between the Medellin cartel and the Colombian government, they agreed not to extradite him to the U.S. if he served full five years of a prison built to his specification. Yes, really, that happened. Dubbed Hotel Escobar, but most commonly known as La Catedral, the stunning complex overlooked the city of Medellin and came with a jacuzzi, football pitch, bar, helipad, and everything else you'd expect in the ultimate man cave. Pablo even had a powerful telescope installed so he could view his daughter's city residence while talking to her on the phone. But as you'd expect, Pablo didn't stay there long. Even though the government had turned a blind eye to his continued drug dealing, it was when he murdered four of his lieutenants inside the compound that they had to tear up their contract. Unbeknownst to them, he had secretly installed an easy to access escape tunnel during the compound's construction. So he simply walked out before the 600 man strong response unit could raid the compound. But life on the lam wouldn't last long. His power was fading. His closest allies had turned on him or had passed on, either at the hands of rivals or police authorities. Money was seized, lost, or confiscated, so his empire was running on fumes. By the end of his life, Escobar was hiding out in an average home in a middle-class area with only a few soldiers sworn to him. Then, on 2nd December 1993, he was intercepted by a surveillance team and went on the run. His final moments were an exchange of gunfire and a barefoot dash across rooftops before the Colombian police force took him down. Yet, one of the bullet holes was in the side of his head. 
Had a lucky shot brought a fatal end to this larger-than-life villain? Or had Pablo used his last breath to rob the police of their victory? Share your theory in the comments section below. If you'd like us to cover more eccentric historical figures, then leave a like to let us know. Be sure to share this with a fan of crime history, and don't forget to subscribe for our next video.